honor and pleasure to be here with Dr. Erica Brown, who is an associate professor of, Curri of curriculum and pedagogy at the George Washington University and the director of its Mayberg Center for Jewish Education and Leadership. She's the author of 12 books on leadership, the Hebrew Bible, and spirituality. Her forthcoming commentary is the book of Esther, Power, Fate, and Fragility in Exile, published by Koren uh, and the OU. So thanks for taking the time to talk. Thank you so much for having me. So just to jump right in, what are some of the pressing needs, gaps, opportunities you see in Jewish education in America? I know that's a massive uh, question, a but question. if you had a top, a top list of, uh, yeah. of, of priorities, what would you place? So I think, I think the answer depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my, my field is really adult education. And in the adult education world that I've seen in the past 32 years of working in this uh, arena is that adults want less and less content delivered in shorter and shorter mm -hmm. bits. Mm -hmm. And that's hard when you have a 4,000 year tradition of scholarship. Right. And so one of the things that I often say is, is we've kind of embraced this march of the Jewish cliche. Yeah. So sometimes I'll be speaking to an audience and I'll say, you know, finish the sentence, right? Lador vador, tikkun olam. You know, there's certain, whoever says one life, and at a certain point you say, we have such a rich tradition, mm -hmm. reach for something deeper. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, we, our texts are on so many different subjects uh, with such substance. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, care about literacy. And actually to that end, uh, we're creating with the Covenant uh, Foundation support, we're creating a three-year program of cohorts, three cohorts, that'll be studying people who work as, in senior leadership capacities in the organized Jewish world and Jewish nonprofits who either aren't Jewish or aren't well-educated Jews who are just perhaps coming into working in a Jewish nonprofit for the first time and doing that deep dive in Jewish literacy and saying, you know, there's cultural competence that's important when you're, when you're working in this community. So in the adult education, I think our issue is content. I think that's the biggest challenge and it will be more of a challenge moving forward if we don't do something serious about it now. Yeah. Um, and I think part of that has to do with Jewish buzzwords, right? Yeah. So we were, in the Jewish Renaissance days, people were consumed mm -hmm. with learning mm -hmm. and that was popular. We've moved on to other sorts of language. Yeah. Um, not right now we're in engagement. And for me, yeah. Judaism is about a marriage. Right. So engagement right. sometimes, it's a connection, yeah. but it's not a commitment. Yeah. And so educating for commitment and educating for being a well-informed mm -hmm. human being um, and, 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 and member of the tribe, so to speak, I think that that's our challenge. In terms of day school education throughout the denominations, um, there's a huge teacher crisis. Yeah. And no one's talking right. about it and no right. one's naming it. It's, ha it's happening across the United States. Uh, parents are not making, demanding parents are not making this easier. Uh, demanding boards that aren't always um, sensitive to the leadership needs of the, the professional leadership needs of a school are making this harder. But really focusing on facilities mm -hmm. and fundraising and not focusing on outstanding mm -hmm. teaching yeah. is always a mistake. Yeah. As I'm sure you know from your own That's many degrees on this, mm -hmm. on this level of all, mm -hmm. that nothing beats a great teacher. Yeah. And sometimes you don't even like a subject, but you have a great teacher. Yeah. And it makes all the difference. Right, right. So we have a crisis of literacy and of, of teachers and, um, uh, and a shifting of the need on, the, on content. And I think this is connected to, to the leadership challenges, although it's, it's separate as well, mm. um, if we're not deeply connected to our texts and values. But what would you point well, to? Well, I want to yeah, say, on, please, the, yeah. on, the, on, the, yes, on the other on the side, because you, you said, yeah, you know, yeah. we talked about crisis, but I yeah, want to talk about yeah. opportunity. Okay, good. You know, when I, when I look at Sfaria, which happens multiple times mm -hmm. a day, mm -hmm. I think to myself, how easy it is yeah. to access all right. these riches. Right. And we, we, we've never had mm -hmm. that before. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm um, for online Torah. Yeah. And uh, I think the ways that you can study mm -hmm. are, just un, are just unbelievable. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, uh, I study Dafyomi every day. Uh, we're, we're almost mm -hmm. done. We uh, just, just passed the seven year mark. And so I tweet on the Daf every yeah, day. Yeah. And I know someone who does art on the Daf yeah, every day. And I know yeah, people who amazing. do poetry. And I know yeah. someone who does limericks. And it's just a really right. interesting time to be creative with text yeah. and to be able to 
kind of breathe them in a really mm -hmm. interesting way, mm -hmm. interesting way. Yeah, and the, with those barriers of accessibility going down. I mean, the fact that you can follow your, yeah, and you should follow <laughs> Dr. Brown's Twitter account to learn the, the page of Tom of the day. And oh, you're not going to learn a page of Tom of the day. Yeah. Oh, no, it'll be less. It'll be <laughs> no, less you're going to spend a, a long okay. time on okay. it. Okay, okay, a little, a little less. Yeah, so a few, ideas, a few ideas a day. And um, we at VBM have podcasts, and, and as you mentioned, Safari, there's so much accessible Torah online. Um, so uh, in terms of the leadership crisis, what, what do you see as some of the main challenges, uh, moral or structural, that we're facing in the organized Jewish community? Um, again, I don't want to only focus on crisis because yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Um, I think there are a few things that are going on that are really interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, Hebrew used the word sisa. There's some kind of fermentation. Something's bubbling up. Um, I think that legacy organizations are challenged right now because many of them are over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. Their movements, whether it's the Federation, whether it's the JCC, Federation's close to my heart. I worked in two federations for about 17 years. Um, and yet, you know, the way that philanthropy works today is not the way that it used to work. Mm -hmm. um, what people are interested in is not necessarily what established organizations are interested mm -hmm. in. Sometimes it takes a long time to yeah. climb up the leadership ranks. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I use this example and, um, and I, f I found it to be an effective, an effective, I suppose, um, metaphor that uh, used to be when you moved into a Jewish community, certainly in the United States, North, North America, I should say, you, it was like a, it was like a fixed menu. Mm -hmm. You know, you came in, you joined a JCC, yeah. you joined a federation, you joined a synagogue, you sent your kids to day school or to Hebrew school. It was a package of mm -hmm. Judaism. And that and that and for decades that carried us. Then we moved to an a la carte menu, mm -hmm. which is we want services, so we can come in yeah. and out of services. Yeah. And so we had really interesting things showing up on uh, demographic studies around the country, which we've done um, many more of of late, so that someone might actually send their children to day school and not be members of the synagogue. That was unimaginable yeah, decades yeah, beforehand. Yeah. So now we've moved to a slightly different menu, and I call it a tapas menu, mm -hmm. right? where we're trying little things here and there, and that's where we get into the engagement versus marriage question mm -hmm. of, about connection versus yeah. versus real commitment. So I think that's, that's a challenge. Yeah. Um, I think actually um, that the millennial population is going to shift, is already shifting, and is going to shift uh, the Jewish landscape right now. Yeah. Certainly the Jewish organizational landscape. There's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of interest. There's a lot of focus on spiritual, social and spiritual justice. Mm -hmm. So there's, there are things w that people want that are much more spiritual than previous generations mm -hmm. who saw service on a board right. as almost a right. sacred experience. Yeah. Now you have people saying, no, we actually want to understand what the Jay and Jewish is right. all about. Yeah. And that's a blessing mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think boards that are sensitive uh, from a leadership perspective are realizing we can't just have a token millennial. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to actually make sure from a gender perspective and from a an age perspective that we're well-rounded. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we've got to throw in this in thinking about it is the way that money has influenced yeah. and affluence has influenced our community mm -hmm. and created lopsided boards. Yeah. And so it used to be that you'd want wealth and wit and wisdom. There's a whole kind of yeah. how you compose yeah. the board, different thinkers, people have different professional expertise. Mm -hmm. Now you look at boards around the country and they're filled with hedge fund managers, right, right. financial advisors, real estate brokers, and you're saying to yourself, I get that mm -hmm. people are making huge contributions, and that's important in Ein Kemach Ein Torah. There's no flower, there's no Torah. And at the same time, it's alienating a lot of people who don't have right. those resources, right. Right. and it's making our organizations less thoughtful about total inclusivity mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. a financial perspective. And I think on the educational side as well, I've seen a move towards more quantitative measurements of success. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, how many people are in the room as opposed to depth and transformation and right. quality of learning. We, do, we have to hit numbers, but yeah. I think that, that that finance model, you know. Well, the question is yeah. what we're measuring. Right. So I, right. I always struggled with people who would tell you right away what the budget is yeah. and what their campaign is, mm -hmm. their annual campaign, what their endowment, mm -hmm. and they say, 
well, how many lives have you touched? Mm -hmm. right? And what's, what is the transformation model? You know, it used to be in Europe, you'd have, uh, you know, someone come and collect from everyone, yeah. right? The gabet stuck out of the community. And although they were part of the there were people who could afford to do more, there was s still a sense of the collective. And so we're losing a little bit of that sense of collective responsibility because once someone says, I can't give that kind of money, mm -hmm. then sometimes they don't give it all. There's some embarrassment yeah. and yeah. they don't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, while I know we're both very passionate about education and leadership, I know our number one passion is Torah, so we should learn a little Torah. Oh, please. Um, so I know you're, you're writing, um, uh, or maybe I've written at this point, um, oh, yeah. a commentary. <laughs> <laughs> it's always an ongoing process. Commentary on, on Megillat Esther, the book of Esther, that we read on Purim. And I wonder, like, you've written on death, you've written on scandals, you've written on Yonah, Jonah. Um, why, why did you decide to, to take this one up? Yeah, that's yeah. a great question. Um, actually, um, my proofs were supposed to arrive today. Oh, so the okay. plane trip oh, over, I was supposed to be reading them oh, a little late so on that side. Like tomorrow. Um, yeah, it, it, it yeah. actually was a very, uh, it's my largest book, probably double the size of, of mm. most of the things that I've written on. And I think that's because Esther has an amazing exegetical mm -hmm. history. Yeah. Um, and also, um, I wrote my dissertation on Esther. Mm. Uh, when I was studying for my doctorate, mm. I wrote on a 16th century commentary of Eliezer Ashkenazi called Yosef Lekach on the Book of Esther. And because I'd spent so many years with this commentary, um, you know, my husband used to call it my other husband, <laughs> was Eliezer Ashkenazi, but I spent so much time yeah. with the book. Right. So it would have been a natural choice. And Koran had given me a choice between doing Jonah and Esther Jonah's obviously shorter, and I think I think I was a little anxious about going back to something that I had an academic mm -hmm. relationship mm -hmm. with, on a much more narrow relationship yeah. with, and and um, and also the you know the doctoral process was was fraught, yeah. uh, as as many are, and yeah. so I just I just put it to the side and I, I said I'll do Jonah. Mm -hmm. I love doing Jonah, mm -hmm. and you know. Despite all the other things that interest me in terms of the way the current community functions, nothing beats biblical interpretation for me. Mm -hmm. That's you know I, I teach weekly on that. That's my primary love, and I didn't let it go. And so when I finished Jonah, the editor had asked me a few weeks after it had come out, what are, you, "Are you ready to do Esther?" And I assumed that someone else had. Yeah. Uh, it's part of a, a series, yeah. so I assumed that someone else had taken it, and no one else had. And I said, where I normally would say yes, I said. Just give me a little while yeah, I have to yeah, think about yeah, it. Yeah. And I really did some really deep, yeah. reflective work on it and yeah. um, whether I was ready to dive into something like yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So why do you think this is uh, relevant or particularly relevant to 21st century American Jews? Oh, for so many reasons. Yeah. Um, as you know, Rabbi, I live in a suburb of Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. So we're in, we're in really the shadow of the leadership capital of the world. And um, I think it's very hard to study Esther seriously without thinking a lot about what it means to be a courtier Jew, what it means to serve in a Jewish capacity, in a, in a non-Jewish court. Uh, mm -hmm. um, what does it mean to be a Jew who serves faithfully with loyalty and patriotism, and yet at the same time hold strong to the values that you have. Mm -hmm. And that's not an easy thing. We have some wonderful yeah. exemplars of that in office, uh, but not a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And so with Esther, the absence of, of God, in a way, of course, all the medieval commentaries mm -hmm. and late into the 16th century were trying to sh show God in all of these illusions rather mm -hmm. than in, um, in God's actual presence as God's name. Uh, and yet I think there's a deeper message here, which is, you know, in the diaspora, it's not that in the diaspora there is no God. It's that in the diaspora, it's harder to access God. Mm. I really do believe that. I think uh, having lived in Israel and studied in Israel, um, there's a sense of intimacy, yeah. geographic intimacy, mm. um, that, um, you know, you're, you're walking on very ancient stones. Yeah. And a lot of our history is there. Yeah. So when, once you get to the diaspora, yeah. you, you, in some way, you almost have to function, not as if there's no God, but as if 
you're out of a system that protects you. Mm -hmm. And um, although I obviously want people to buy the book, I think my chidush, uh, if I had one, um, my, my sort of intellectual contribution in the book is that when you look at the last chapter of Esther, where Mordechai has his glorious yeah. robes yeah. and where he's able to seek the good of his community and the good of mm -hmm. and the good of um, uh, the king's empire, it's it's only three verses. It's I mean, it's it's, it's yeah. much much shorter yeah. than any other yeah. chapter, and I think it's a way of cutting short the story while it's still happy. Mm -hmm. Because I think if you travel just a little further, yeah. as we know in diaspora life, mm -hmm. you travel down the road of political security and financial security, mm -hmm. and then Vayakam Melech Chadash, right? Mm -hmm. the, a new king arises, right. who didn't know Joseph, right? Yeah. Who didn't know Mordechai, who didn't know Esther. Yeah. And, um, and so that was actually one of the challenges of writing the book yeah. in the diaspora, mm -hmm. is, is in some way reading it as a criticism of living in the diaspora. Yeah. You might figure this out now, yeah. but it doesn't mean it's gonna last. Right, yeah. <sighs> wow. Um, so we got a buy plane, plane tickets. Yeah. <laughs> so, I just came back. Just you came know, back. It's, um, uh, it, it's noted that Kant once said that if someone is in a private act of prayer and they're seen, that they're embarrassed. Mm. You know, that's the sense of, where is God in the diaspora, that sense of, of uh, not wanting to actually be a believer, you know, or be someone connected. And, I, and, and it feels to me like Megillah Tester is connected to pride and shame in profound mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. Jewish pride and, and also, uh, you know, some dimensions of shame and how it relate to the story. Oh, the covering up. The covering up. The covering yeah. up of identity, right. the revelation of identity, how yeah. that happens. So I, I'm, I'm very interested in identity. Um, I, I teach a, a course in um, diversity in a graduate school. Uh, open to all students, and I spent a lot of time thinking about aspects of identity and how identity is formed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, when you look at, you know, Esther's journey of trying to figure out her own leadership moments, right, that yeah. destiny moment, when she sort of takes charge and instead of being passive and following her Uncle Mordecai's mandates, she actually recruits power for herself yeah. and she tells him what to do yeah. and that's a really interesting transition as, mm -hmm. a, as a human being and then the question is what then you know how did this story really end and then it's just cut yeah. off in a yeah. place where it's yeah. just hitting its stride mm -hmm. and so that cut off is very interesting to how me. do you, my last question there how do you how do you which is a big one how do you grapple with what appears to be a massacre appears to be a um uh, a massive abuse of military power. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, of course, um, of course, many people don't realize that. I believe it's seven thousand eight hundred eleven people die. Seventy seventy five thousand eight hundred eleven people die in Megillah in the in the scroll. Uh, Persians. Um, of course, if you look carefully, you know that this was not Esther Mordechai's choice that the king was limited by the rules that were created um, that for him uh, or given to him. I, I'm sure it wasn't a constitutional monarchy, so perhaps these were his own rules or the rules of his ministers, that he couldn't reverse a decree. And I think that also signals, that's a red flag of living in the diaspora, is having to follow rules that aren't your rules, that don't make sense, mm -hmm. that, that actually can hurt right. and that can be painful. Mm -hmm. Um, and as much as we celebrate Purim and it's a time of joy and giving gifts to each other, mm -hmm. imagine what it might feel like on the Persian calendar. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Well, we hope folks will pick up the Book of Esther when it comes out in 2020. It's presumably. coming out this winter. This winter. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for this time. Thank Lots of you. Continued.